Page six of the contract is pretty straightforward. Um, address at the top as per usual. Uh, mediation and arbitra arbitration clause. Um, this is the exact same uh, clause that is in the listing contract if you uh, have written a listing contract. Basically, the way I describe this paragraph is that if in the course of a year, the seller or buyer, either party really, feels that there is something fraudulent or discriminatory or in general just hinky uh, with the transaction, they have up to a year to file a claim with the Kentucky Real Estate Commission um, against whatever party they feel um, was in violation. So it could be an agent, the seller, um, a lender, an appraiser, anybody in uh, regards to this transaction. Well, they have up to a year to file that claim and then um, whoever's involved in that claim would go to mediation and should it not be resolved there, you would move to binding arbitration. Um, your other provision section. So this is where any term that is not specifically spelled out in the contract already would be written in. So for instance, if you want it to be contingent upon inspections, you don't need to spell that out here because that is already outlined in the contract. A term that is very, very common and not outlined in the contract is asking for the seller to pay for the closing costs and prepaids of the buyer. So in our example, we have a $200,000 loan. So seller to pay up to, we'll say $5,000 of buyer's closing costs prepaids, escrows, and all other fees associated with buyer's closing. At your orientation, you should have received a um, piece of paper that has some helpful other provisions, and that language is spilled out there. Um, if you aren't sure exactly what all this means, I, uh, we'd be happy to explain it. However, the reason you want to be a little bit more detailed in here and not stop right here um, because closing costs are actually pretty minimal. Like the closing costs um, are probably going to be maybe around fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars, because that's basically the lender fee, maybe two thousand lender fee and um, title attorney to run title. Your prepaids are what gets more costly, and those are your deposits into your escrow accounts for your homeowners insurance, your tax escrows. Um, maybe a, an appraisal fee that you paid for it but get reimbursed for it, you know, something like that. Um, those get a little bit more costly. So that's why you want to be um, pretty thorough with how you spell this out to make sure that all of the fees that your buyer needs are actually being paid for. Um, if you are personally buying a piece of real estate, you need to disclose that you're an agent. So um, let's see, seller acknowledges buyer is a licensed realtor in the state of Kentucky. Um, perhaps there is a specific closing agent this needs to close with. So closing to occur at agency title, for instance. Um, so these are just some examples of some other provisions. If it is contingent upon the property closing, um, you already have it under contract. Contract is contingent upon you know, contingent upon closing of buyer's property located at 123 Main Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 4222. Um, so that means that this property has to close in order for the purchaser to buy the property that they're making an offer on. If it is contingent upon the sale and close, um, I always spell that out here because not everybody, um, hold on, not everybody can read. <laughs> so I always like to spell it out right here um, just to make sure people recognize that I'm going to check this box right here. So um, never hurts to be too thorough. So these are some examples of some other provisions. If you have a buyer that has a weird request or um, another weird situation, like maybe short sales, or if you're making a backup offer or things like that, um, you can refer to that list in your orientation binder of the helpful other provisions and get some ideas. And of course, if it's not listed in there and it needs to be in your other provisions, um, feel free to ask for help and guidance on making sure that you get what you need.
Um, so in our example, we're not going to make contingent upon a closing or a sale. We're just going to move right along. Um, if you are buying a house in a subdivision that's not that has a homeowners association um, it, and is not required to present those bylaws, you can ask for the HOA um, rules and regulations to be given to you as a part of this contract. Um, if you have a delayed possession agreement that you're attaching to this, go ahead and plug that bad boy right in here and make it part of your contract. Um, and then this one's with new construction, which honestly I've never checked that box before. So, um, or if there's another addendum that you're attaching, spell it out right there. Um, no rescission period. I like to call this the no lemon law. So once everybody signs, that means we're moving forward. If everybody accepts and agrees, then one party can't be like, well, I rethought it and I don't actually want to buy this house or I don't actually want to sell this house. So uh, no lemon law. Once everybody signs, we're moving forward. And we're just going to roll into page seven because this last page is so short. Um, property address at the top. And this is the response time that you are giving to the seller to respond. So in this case, it's super late at night. I'm not going to uh, make somebody respond super early in the morning. So I would be uh, a good, decent human and maybe say by 5 p.m. on the 16th day of August 2019. Uh, be aware of your timelines. Um, if you're competing, it might be in your best interest to have the, well, it's always in your best interest to have a conversation with the listing agent. However, just understand when they're going to be presenting offers and make sure that, you know, they have time to respond and understand the situation of the seller. Like if they work third shift and are going to be asleep during the day, don't try and force a response by noon. You're not going to get one. Um, just have conversations with the other agent and find out what you need to do in order to be uh, making the best offer possible. And not, you know, don't give yourself too, too long. You know, don't give yourself three days for them to respond and allow other offers to come in either. So just be smart and strategic about your response time. Uh, buyer names, buyer signatures. Now, if you're on the seller side, uh, first and foremost, respond within your deadline. And if you can't, ask for an extension. Nothing gets under my skin more than sellers who just outright ignore me. Um, and don't even give me a courtesy message to say, hey, we're not going to be able to get to you, or hey, we're not accepting, or hey, we accepted another offer, or whatever. So be a good human, good agent karma, respond within the timeline, because this is a, this is a legal document, and I'm just going to get up on my pedestal for a minute. This is a legal document, and we need to make sure people understand that their signature on here means something. And that the terms in here mean something. So if we have a 5 p.m. response time, make sure your seller knows that they need to respond within this timeline or else they risk losing a buyer and having an invalid contract because they chose to not respond in time or you as the agent chose to be lazy and not get a response in time. So stepping right off my pedestal back down to this contract here. Um, if you choose to accept the offer as is, accept right here or if uh, you got another offer and you don't like mine and you want to just flat out reject it you can reject it right here as well um, it is a best practice to always send a formal rejection for any offer that you don't want to work uh, because that will ensure that the buyer knows that your offer was reviewed um, you never want to give another agent or a, another consumer the impression that you might have not even reviewed their offer. And a formal rejection, if you aren't going to work with it, uh, will give that clarity that your offer was actually, or that their offer was actually presented. If you want to counter, come on down here, um, fill out your appropriate form. So let's say this was countered at 2 p.m. on the 16th day of August. 2019 and they'll say sales price to be 205 now only counter the terms you want to change so notice I'm not mentioning anything about the closing costs here because I'm accepting paying their 5,000 closing costs because of this section right here all other terms and conditions remain the same I am accepting their 10-day inspection window I'm accepting the home warranty they're asking me to buy I am accepting their financing terms. 
I'm accepting their closing cost. The only thing I'm not accepting is their $200,000 200, offer price. So only change the terms here that you wish to change in your counter offer. Otherwise, everything else stays the same. Um, give the buyer a response time, so maybe 10 a.m. on the 17th of August 2019, not August. Whew, all right, print and sign, and then the game continues, okay? That seems fair. We want to accept that. Congratulations, you sold a home. Um, or the buyer can counter and say, I'm not willing to pay that, but I will bring my own closing costs. So if you let me pay 200, I'll pay my own closing costs. Whatever the case may be. So um, just remember that anytime you, anytime you counter, it opens the door for the other party to say no. So that's why it's always a good idea to have conversations with the other agents and just um, make an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> and try and get everybody to the table uh, with terms that make everybody happy. So as Keller Williams Culture says, win-win or no deal. So that is my official walkthrough of the purchase contract. I hope you found this information valuable and possibly entertaining. And uh, feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions about any particular scenario, term, uh, anything like that that you come up in the contract. We are certainly here to help you and make sure you have a very successful contract writing uh, experience.